Kim, welcome everyone today to the webinar. Appreciate everyone being on. As Minnesota communities look for innovative ideas to provide residents and visitors with good, healthy, fresh food, they find they must navigate legal requirements of the food safety system and are discovering that MDA, MDH, and local inspectors are valuable partners and resources in these efforts. This webinar will address key challenges and opportunities identified by Minnesota communities in their work to increase access to healthy, safe food. Speakers will discuss key barriers limiting some of the local efforts to promote healthy food identified through the Healthy Food Safe Food Project, a joint initiative between the University of Minnesota Extension and the Minnesota Department of Health. Regulatory and legal framework governing food safety and resources available to support local efforts navigating food safety laws and opportunities to work with state and local food safety inspectors to identify and resolve challenges in meeting food safety requirements at the local level. Today's speakers are Valerie Gamble, Outreach and Delegation Coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, Stephen Diaz, Food, Pools, and Lodging Services Manager with the Minnesota Department of Health, Mary Morrow, Staff Attorney, Public Health Law Center, and me, Kim Jenkins, Food Access Coordinator, Minnesota Department of Health. Mary is working on legal and policy initiatives to increase access to healthy food and a physical activity in local communities at the state level and nationally. Prior to joining the Public Health Law Center, Mary was a public interest practitioner for over a decade, focusing her efforts on poverty law, international human rights, and environmental advocacy. Valerie works with industry groups, nonprofit organizations, and state and local agencies around Minnesota to provide information and raise awareness of food and feed safety programs and regulations. Prior to this, she was a supervisor and field inspector for the food inspection program at MDA. She has a master's degree in geological sciences and worked for five years with organic and conventional farms and orchards in California, first directly with farms and then with the agriculture, agricultural extension program at the University of California, Davis. Stephen is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin River Falls with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Microbiology and a Registered Environmental Health Specialist, and another word for that is Sanitarian. He, worked, he has worked for the Minnesota Department of Health in food, pools, and lodging services section since 2002, including experience designing and conducting research studies associated with food service establishments for the CDC. Inspecting food service establishments, lodging facilities, swimming pools, youth camps, manufactured home parks, and recreational camping areas, and assisting with numerous foodborne illness outbreak investigations. Stephen's roles have included supervisor of the Metro Field Inspection Staff from 2009 to 2013, business and finance operations unit supervisor, and assistant section manager. Stephen now is the manager for the section food pools and lodging section. And for me, growing up in Minnesota, I've been connected with the food system. Um, my family uh, farmed and was involved with extension and 4-H going way back. I worked my way through college picking apples in Wisconsin, blueberries in Maine, and working in restaurants, processing plants, and even cutting meat for a while. I then got into public health and discovered the field of environmental health, first working in uh, migrant farm worker health, then as an environmental food safety inspector, and then as a supervisor for the city of Minneapolis for several really interesting and enjoyable years. And now I'm food access coordinator for the Minnesota Department of Health, working with partners across Minnesota to make it easier for people to access healthy, safe food, especially people who have the least opportunities for health. Today we're going to talk about two equally important objectives we need to that we need to integrate as a system to address the tension between increasing access to healthy food and ensuring safe food. Sometimes efforts toward the public good conflict, conflict with each other. If we are willing to work through the discomfort and uh, bumpy parts collaboratively, the bumps in the road, we find that there are opportunities to strengthen both systems that we hadn't seen before. 
So these experiences that we've talked about in different parts of the food system for, between all of us farm to table help lead up to uh, what I'm going to present next is the Healthy Food Safe Food Project, which started to really take shape when I joined the state and uh, started working with colleagues grappling with paradoxical food systems challenges. Uh, one of the examples, uh, just to give an idea of what this is about, is when I worked for the city of Minneapolis, <clears throat> we had someone come to the city and say that they wanted to go and sell fresh uh, grocery items, produce, vegetables, milk, you know, in a mobile uh, vehicle in neighborhoods. And at the same time, ice cream trucks with ice cream, good stuff, you know, tasty ice cream, chips, pop, candy, prepackaged foods could, could sell uh, everywhere in the city. They wanted it. And we had to say, no, I'm sorry, we don't have a license at this time for the uh, fresh, healthy food to be sold in the same way. So that's one of the paradoxical situations we're dealing with. It just, if, you, if you talk to someone outside, either food access or food safety, they say that doesn't make sense. So those are the kinds of issues that, just to give an example. So the food access coordinator position was created about four years ago, largely because of the need to address food safety and food safety regulations in efforts to increase access to healthy foods. Some other examples, school salad bars, farm to school, changes in uh, school and child care nutrition standards, procurement and uh, community food access efforts such as sampling at farmers markets and food shelves. These were some of the examples that created a need for a deeper dive into the regulatory world. Uh, many partners, state and local, were looking we're working closely together to create healthier food environments in Minnesota uh, communities through what we call PFC, Policy Systems and Environmental Change, using the uh, Collective Act Impact Approach, everybody working together. Some examples of uh, this are the Minnesota Food Charter, the Community Transformation Grant, the Statewide Health Improvement Program, SHIP, um, and a move by extension through SNAP-Ed to uh, work in policy systems and environmental change. Uh, and other food access, access efforts across sectors were happening at the same time. Other states were seeing the same kinds of activities and also uh, these same challenges are seen globally. The crux of the challenge is that upstream public health efforts encounter the existing food system infrastructure, including many regulatory elements. The experience and perspective from the local level, the ground level, was needed to understand the issues, the challenges, and needed resources, and to take action steps to address them. So the University of Minnesota Extension and the Minnesota Department of Health Office of Statewide Health Improvement Initiatives created this joint initiative to conduct a formative evaluation and develop an, and implement a plan of action. The project is about making it easier to choose healthy foods while maintaining food safety especially for those who have the greatest barriers, such as people with low income, facing disparities, racism, bias, uh, mobility issues, mental health, and other uh, health equity concerns. So as an inspector, uh, from time to time, a thought would run through my head when I was doing a, when I was working in food safety. Some of the safest food is really fairly unhealthy or not as healthful and some of the healthiest food has extra steps and precautions needed in handling and preparation to make sure it's safe. Uh, one example is uh, not naming any particular establishment, but very, you know, like a, the chicken nugget. It's deep fried at very high temperatures and it's fairly, you know, everything's, all the microbes are taken care of in that way. Um, <clears throat> so that's very safe food, but people would argue maybe not as healthy. And then I already talked about the ice cream trunk example earlier. So, so this team, we have a really excellent team collaborating to do this uh, formative evaluation of this project. The University Ex Extension, Department of Health I mentioned, um, Public Health Law Center, the Food Charter, the Local Foods Advisory Committee, and many other stakeholders farm to table. The purpose of the project is to identify rules, regulations, and policies that hinder Minnesotans from making healthy food choices. 
those that would make it easier for Minnesotans to make healthy food choices, especially for those who have the greatest barriers. Identify efforts that will make sure that food safety is considered and taken care of in efforts to improve food access. Uh, understand the training, knowledge, and resources needed of local public health and extension employees and others in changing these policy systems and environments related to healthy food, safe food, and then to learn what systems-based changes would make it easier to provide access to safe, healthy food. Uh, and the results of the research, the, the formative evaluation, are being used to develop a plan of action for implementation. So the methods, we gathered a team of people very carefully to uh, listen to what was happening on the front line, and the findings are based on input from over 100 people across Minnesota. Uh, we had 28 key informant interviews, one interviewer debrief and planning session, four focus groups with uh, 34 staff from Extension, SHIP, you know, local public health SHIP, and tribal health, one focus group with six people representing food businesses from farm to table, a farmer, uh, child care provider, school food, food service, uh, uh, food truck operator, and someone rep representing the emergency food system and um, in a community kitchen. And then we had one focus group with uh, two regulators and a listening session with uh, nutrition educators in the metro area, extension nutrition educators. And all that information was gathered and, uh, and then we had a project sponsor prioritization session with 12 participants in that. And as you can see here, we did, we did our very best to make sure that the people involved with this work were represented uh, from all sectors, as many as possible. So we had people looking at the food system from different angles and different challenges. There was the health, uh, hunger, diet-related illness, um, economic impact, and food access. From the food protection standpoint, um, foodborne illness outbreaks happen at all levels and from all sources, from local to global. Excuse me, in Minnesota, between 2011 and 2015, there were 289 outbreaks, <clears throat> 6,893 uh, illnesses, 887 hospitalizations, and 27 deaths. Um, this so we have very important public health issues, both from the um, chronic disease side of things and the acute disease side of things. And they're both equally important. We need to uh, pay attention to both, of course. And then some things that are surprising about Minnesota. Minnesota is known uh, as one of the healthiest states in the nation. I mean, we have that status for quite a while, but we have some very serious health disparities. Many of them are related to uh, food access. Um, so equity is at the core of our work, both food safety and food access. And these are the challenges we have, have to address. For example, very surprising that uh, we're among the uh, worst states in terms of fresh, healthy food access. This was a study done by the um, National Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve Bank and Wilder. And then we recently were voted number one for uh, child well-being, but the disparities were some of the worst in that case. And from a consumer standpoint, Minnesotans want high, healthier foods and stronger connection to food from farm to table. Also to know more about foods we are eating. Some of the top trends are locally sourced foods, healthy kids meals, environmental sustainability, uh, locally grown uh, produce, those kinds of things. So, the, so we're seeing uh, demand reflect uh, the trends that are happening in, in this, this, these efforts. And we know, all know that this, we're dealing with a very complex system uh, in terms of roles, responsibilities, legal obligations, swim lanes, and that 
those sorts of things make this work very challenging but interesting too. And the complexity is also found in the regulatory system, as you can see from that list. Complexity that we can de definitely take on if we understand that food protection entails many elements beyond the food code, such as community planning, zoning, licensing, building codes, etc., which all really impact access. And these are all tied together through an interplay between federal, state, and local regulations. But don't worry, there's a way to, to, to address this. Changing them can be done, but it takes time. Uh, it takes, but the time it takes is worth the effort and provides opportunities for uh, collaborative problem solving and a chance to engage the community and government. And there's a wide range of uh, definitions that people have for healthy food, from cultural to uh, food safety to nutrition, many different perspectives on that. That's okay as well. And then again, food safety, even though it seems kind of cut and dry in some cases, it's not. Uh, but overall, the people in the, uh, the research agreed that it was very important, and a lot of people knew a lot about it. And they agreed that, they, but they did agree too that the regulations are complex and there are different interpretations and perspectives on what constitutes food safety. So here's an example of a systems integration that achieves food safety and food access. Regulatory requirements were a barrier to educational food sampling and cooking demonstrations at farmers markets. But the need was high because many people are unfamiliar with how to cook fresh produce and haven't tasted some of the foods at farmers markets, especially kids. Also, people started being able to use nutrition assistance benefits at farmers markets and food skills education was very important and also taste testing. So a big team of stakeholders worked together from government, from the community, and, and other sectors, and work together to make it feasible for food sampling and cooking demonstrations to have again, happen again at markets. They had to stop for a while. And at the same time, added in very good and important food safety elements to the, to the process. So now, here's an example where you can achieve both food access and food safety. So here's a quote that I think uh, is, gets to the heart of the, the findings or of the, the project from one of the uh, informants, key informant interviewees. Nobody wants to say they're against food safety, but there are trade-offs between food safety and food access. The trade-offs is torn between whether you are focused on chronic disease or acute disease. A conversation needs to be had about finding a balance between the trade-offs. And so, we use this um, healthy food to less healthful food continuum crossed with a continuum between unsafe to safe food uh, as a framework to guide discussions. And it helped the participants understand the issue and it created a rich dialogue um, and discussion. So basically, to sum it up, what participants said is that, um, well, the two X's say that there was not a lot of talk about healthy and unsafe foods or less healthful foods and unsafe foods. That's, no one really wants too many of those. But people felt that the lower right quadrant, safe and less healthful foods, was too prolific in our food environment, wherever we work, live, play, learn, those kinds of things, where we live, you know, in our environment. And we need to work together to get more the upper right quadrant healthy food, safe food, to be the most prolific and easily, most easily accessible uh, food in our, in our, wherever, whoever we are and wherever we go. So that's, that's what people recommended that we work together to make that the number one default quadrant of type of food. So here's what people said should be done to achieve that. Uh, here are the top 10 priorities in order, and the, bo the bottom uh, four, four were tied. But promote collaboration among local public health extension and food safety to support healthy food and you know, safe food. Number two, to make Minnesota's food safety system rules easier to navigate, understand, and interpret consistently. Uh, three, to 
to address misperceptions about approved sources of food. And other, there are other regulations that need clarification and, um, and communication. Uh, to, decrease, to, decrease, uh, to decrease fear associated with the inspection process, liability, uh, causing foodborne illness, um, and this should be done through increased education and opportunities for communication and under, understanding, understanding the reasons behind the regulations. People wanted to understand more about why the regulations are in place. And then uh, the more setting-based issues were, you know, supporting and figuring out a way to make uh, educational food sampling and cooking demonstrations more feasible at food shelves and other priority locations, uh, to support child care providers in offering safe, healthy foods. Uh, people were really concerned about children and their future and learning good uh, habits and being exposed to uh, different kinds of foods in terms of their uh, trying things and tasting things. Um, and then uh, next one, supporting new food businesses in the licensing process. There are quite a few new different ideas about you know, healthy food concepts, uh, businesses that are trying to increase access to healthy foods in different ways, new kinds of grocery stores. One I heard about recently was open 24-7 and you have a card to get in and you can pretty much serve yourself. Those kinds of ideas, uh, people thought, thought that we should work, out, figure out a way to um, facilitate and, and maybe expedite the licensing process so they can get in operation uh, more readily. Food waste was a huge uh, concern for people and uh, there are some uh, clarifications and regulatory adjustments that might need to be made to make that more possible. Maybe uh, using some food that's thrown away now uh, in terms of increasing access and availability of food. And then uh, food that's, that you know, support healthier food and vending machines. Vending machines are learning are a source of food for many people um, and also, you know, when we're going out in the community to events and activities, you know, at concession stands and, and uh, school-related activities, the food there could be healthier and we need to figure, there's some regulatory issues that we need to look at in terms of that. And then in general, uh, the staff asked, you know, that they, for support because this is tough work on the front line, uh, you know, doing policy systems and environmental change, you're, in, you're, you're changing things. And so they, they sometimes feel a little bit pinched and uh, so they need, they would like some support on that. So, so this is the plan of action to create a uh, healthy food, safe food action guide, toolkit, and website in progress. Excuse me, do we have a question? Or? Oh, okay, go back, let's go back. <clears throat> okay, so this priority level was the result of a, that sponsor session that I mentioned at, at, at the, in the methodology slide where the, the project sponsors um, and some key uh, uh, team members got together and we looked at the um, results from the research and uh, came up with a priority level. Um, <clears throat> and this is how it turned out. Uh, in this order. So, plan of action is to create a healthy food, safe food action guide, a toolkit, and a website. This is in progress and hopefully coming very soon in the next couple months. Uh, and the high priority is to communicate the findings, such as we're doing now, back to the uh, participants in the in a, in a action plan, you know, shift extension sectors and other partners, and then to implement the project and expand and strengthen the partnerships we have developed among state, stakeholders such as the people that have been involved in the project, uh, agriculture, uh, community development and planning is another area that we want to uh, connect with and nexus with, and then um, connected to employment and economic development, and then nationally and internationally this, this same kind of topic is, is uh, uh, raising up on, on, on people's radar and agendas. So I will turn it now over to Mary. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, 
So what I'm going to spend a little bit of time going over right now is really in response to some of those key priorities that Tim just identified as far as where um, the Healthy Food Safe Food Project identified um, the, the greatest interest and the highest priority for people in learning to navigate the food safety system and where people are running into trouble. So I'm going to spend um, my time talking about just the general structure of the food safety, food safety legal and regulatory system, and then um, our speakers from MDH and MDA are going to talk more about how that applies um, in their regulatory role. Before I get started, though, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Public Health Law Center, um, we are a policy organization based at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, and we focus on finding, working with community members and partners to find legal and policy solutions to um, address the chronic health diseases that um, are facing us through obesity, um, tobacco control, um, or tobacco use, lack of physical activity, and um, poor eating habits. And I think that with the healthy eating piece, um, where Tim mentioned there's, there's kind of a range with food safety has oftentimes focused on acute disease like um, bacterial infections or foodborne illness, things like that. Um, we're learning that um, we also need our food to be nutritious because chronic health diseases like um, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke and other um, things that we're experiencing um, on a wide scale basis in our population are affected by some of those, um, the, the need to have more access and consumption of healthy food. So the Public Health Law Center works with a number of partners, including the Minnesota Department of Health, local departments of public health here in Minnesota. Um, we've been developing a partnership with MDA, the Department of Agriculture, and um, we also do work around the country to, um, on some of these efforts. Um, and so as part of the work that we do, we um, provide legal research, um, we help develop policies, um, develop publications, which I'll be talking about, and then also provide training such as this webinar. We do not directly represent um, individuals in a as a nice client attorney um, relationship and we don't lobby. And one of the things that we are really trying to um, look more closely at is how um, the work that we do and how laws and policies can be used as a tool to address equity issues in our community. And Tim mentioned how there are a lot of inequities in our food system and in the health that um, different community members experience. And it's, it's, a, it's a real concern, I think, that Minnesota, you know, which we pride ourselves on being a progressive state and really having um, high health indicators and, um, a, and a high quality of life. It, it's concerning to see that at the same time we have um, relatively poor access to healthy food as shown by the, the, um, the study that Tim mentioned and also that we have some pretty significant health disparities, disparities that are impacting different segments of our population. And I think that it's an opportunity as we're working in this chronic disease prevention work to try to really think about where are the groups in our communities that are, have the greatest need and how can we identify and address those. And food safety work is no exception to that. Um, one of the things that I can think about with um, equity and food safety is um, if you think about immigrant farmers and um, how we have this really robust food safety system that I'll be talking about, but it really is based on a certain assumption of familiarity with a Western regulatory system, comfort and um, in approaching people in positions of power like inspectors or other people who may be seen as kind of an authority figure or a gatekeeper. And, and you can see that people coming from different cultures or different backgrounds may have different levels of comfort in engaging in that system and, may, and we may need to develop some additional resources or support so that so, you know, immigrant farmers, um, I can think of like the Hmong Farmers Association and others who are providing a, such a critical um, service to our communities through farmers markets and local food production, we want to make sure that those um, farmers also are able to navigate the food safety system. So when I think about the food safety system, I think about it in kind of in a continuum and it's not just, it doesn't just go one way, it's a back and forth kind of continuum. Um, from the federal level with the Food and Drug Administration and the Food Safety Modernization Act is really getting a lot of attention now 
to um, what we're going to be focusing on most here today is looking at the state level of regulatory system here in Minnesota, which really a lot of it ties around the Minnesota Food Code and the two key state agencies that are involved, the Minnesota Department of Health and Department of Agriculture. And then also we want to recognize that there's a, there's a layer of um, um, local government authority that's involved and then that there may be internal like food safety and food sa uh, handling um, policies that may also be come into play. So first of all, I think it's important to recognize what is um, a foodborne illness or injury. And um, because that's really, I think, when we're talking about food safety, at least at this point, we're really focusing on an illness or an injury that's caused by the con um, ingestion of food contaminated with either, um, you know, some kind of a vir virus or like norovirus or um, E. coli bacteria or other pathogen or other um, foreign objects that are in our food. And the food safety process, as I've been working on this issue um, for a number of years, I you know, really struggle to try to understand the, the, the process and how to break the regulatory system down in a way to make it more manageable. And as I've worked with community members across Minnesota and with uh, my partners at MDH and MDA, kind of came up with this framework of thinking about the um, legal structure for um, food safety. And so I've broken it down into thinking about preventing foodborne illness in Minnesota. So like before you eat the food, what is the legal system that is in place to, to, to um, make sure that that food is safe? We know it's not a foolproof system. There's risks involved, but there's a lot that can go into preventing there ever being a foodborne illness um, or injury. But then if there is a foodborne illness or injury, then there's a governmental response to that. And so what is the legal structure that responds to if, uh, this foodborne illness or injury or outbreak? And we'll be hearing from MDH and MDA about um, their involvement in that. And then one of the things that comes up a lot um, in my work as um, an attorney working with um, folks who have questions is who's responsible for um, an illness or injury if it happens? So I'm going to quickly um, go through this and then, um, then you'll be able to access these resources that will give you more information. So with preventing foodborne illness, um, one of the things that's really important is that you just understand who's responsible for what in that process. So this is um, in the resource that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a chart that kind of breaks it down as far as what MDH is responsible for and what MDA is responsible for. And it, it, it is, some of it makes sense and some of it is kind of confusing. And so I just this is a nice way to, um, hopefully we can capture that and help you understand some of that the difference between those roles and responsibilities. Likewise, there's a similar kind of a breakdown of responsibility between MDA and MDH. That is, um, all, this breakdown of responsibility is in Minnesota laws and rules, so that there's a legal framework that creates this breakdown of responsibility. And these resources are meant to provide you with that snapshot of what those um, legal responsibilities are under Minnesota law, and then, um, and then we'll hear how it plays out actually in um, the experience of people at MDA and MDH. And then the area that I think um, people have a lot of questions about is this question of who's legally responsible for foodborne injury and illness. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time recognizing that this is a, can be a very complicated area and this is going to be a really high level review. Um, and that we have this new resource that um, hopefully will help you understand some of that a bit more. So when you think about um, liability, basically um, liability determines the responsibility an individual or entity has for harm caused by an illness or injury in the, when we're thinking about food. And basically the standards for holding someone liable or responsible for an injury or illness differs depending on what or who caused the injury. One of the things I think is important to, to recognize is when we're talking about liability with food, we're talking about civil liability and not criminal liability. And criminal liability um, is something that um, happens when the government punishes an individual for or um, an entity for something that is done to society or that has criminal intent. And I will say that some food safety issues might get to criminal liability. I don't know if people are familiar with the recent peanut butter um, case where I think it was in Georgia. Um, it's been in the news a fair amount in the past year or so. Um, some of the, the high-level officials in that peanut butter um, 
corporation were found to be criminally liable because of the actions that they took that caused a widespread outbreak of disease and I think some deaths um, from peanut butter that was not um, um, packaged properly. But we're, ta we're focusing on civil liability here. And I think that what's important to keep in mind with um, food is that there is um, a concept called strict liability that is applied to foodborne illness and injury. And what that means in the civil world is that if you're strictly liable, you could be held responsible for an illness or injury even if you didn't do anything wrong. And so food is different from other kinds of liability where someone had to be negligent or there would be some, some fault. With strict liability, there does not have to be any fault for someone to be found legally responsible. So this gets people's attention in the food world, understandably. And at the same time, while um, strict liability is the, um, is the legal framework that governs foodborne illness and injury in Minnesota, there are some exceptions to, or, and potential exceptions to strict liability. And again, I just want to say that our resources go into this in more detail. But um, Minnesota has a, an exemption for passive sellers that um, basically says that if you were just a, a passive seller and you didn't do anything to cause the, the foodborne illness or injury, that you would not be found liable uh, as long as some other um, qualification or some other elements were met. In addition, there's something called contributory negligence. So if somehow you were that the person who got sick was somehow involved in creating the problem, um, then the person who sold the food may not be fully liable. So that, I think an example of that is if someone doesn't um, cook their eggs completely and, um, and you know, people know that they should be aware that, that eggs need to be cooked completely. And so if there is a, if so someone um, assumed that responsibility and ate a sunny side egg, up egg, <laughs> Um, and they got sick from that, then maybe the egg seller wouldn't be found fully responsible for that illness. And then there's also some liability protections for people who are donating food that I think is really important when we're thinking about equity issues to make sure that you know, people who may not be able to afford um, healthy food um, and people who want to support um, lower income people can donate healthier food and not have to worry about whether or not they would be found liable if someone got sick from that food. And we also have a resource that goes over this. So I know that this is a really quick overview. Um, one of the things, too, I think that's really important to keep in mind is that there's a lot of risk management um, practices that, that um, food producers or sellers can um, engage in to, make, to reduce the chance that someone would get sick from their food. And, um, and this is some, some of those um, good um, food safety practices or policies that a farmer or an organization may have to just make sure that they are actually following best practices in um, handling their food. Also, having liability insurance coverage is, is a tool that can be used so that if something does happen, that, um, that there's some insurance coverage that can protect against that. So with that, I'm going to um, just mentioned that we do have these resources um, that, are, that, that I've been mentioning, the Preventing Foodborne Illness, Responding to Foodborne Illness, and Legal Responsibility for Foodborne Illness Outbreaks. And they'll be available on our website, and we'll be sending you a notice when, they are, um, have they, when they've been completed. Now I'm going to turn this over to our next speaker, Valerie Gamble from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Okay. Thank you, Mary and Tim. I'm just going to do a, a pretty brief overview of what we do at the Department of Agriculture and then also kind of highlight some recent changes in our structure that are leading, hopefully, to increased equity in what, in what we do on a daily basis. So just at a, a very high level there, as Mary said, there are two state agencies, the Minnesota Department of Health and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture that oversee food safety, and then we also partner with local public health agencies. We both have delegation agreements with a number of, of local agencies to do food safety work in the state. Uh, this graphic just kind of represents how, 
how the food safety work is split up between these agencies. So the Minnesota Department of Agriculture is responsible for agricultural produ production, manufacturers and wholesalers, and then also retail food, so grocery stores, convenience stores. And then the Minnesota Department of Health and local public health agencies do food service and then also retail food if the local health agencies are delegated or operating under delegation agreements with the Department of Agriculture. So this graph kind of summarizes where we are in the Food and Feed Safety Division at the Department of Agriculture today. This is very different from how it looked a year ago. Uh, we recently went through a complete reorganization and this is the result. So we have three separate inspection programs at this point in time, manufactured food, retail food, and then our commercial feed program, which also does pet food. Um, and then we have four support units that were created, again, a year ago, that work with all three of those inspection programs. And just as an example, I'm part of the response training and outreach support unit, and we work, we work with the inspection programs to make sure that everyone gets the training that they need. Um, the response portion of that is our rapid response team, which is, as Mary said earlier, you know, we're involved with foodborne illness response. That's, that's the part of our program that really deals heavily with that. Um, and then on the outreach front, we're really trying to focus on hearing what different communities need and providing resources that meet those needs. So it's, you know, it's still a work in progress and we're I would say still experiencing some growing pains with this, but overall it's been a very good split and you know, we're really trying to focus in to allow inspectors to provide materials that people need when they actually need them. So we're allowing our inspectors to specialize with this division. And I did put the produce safety program on there as well under the inspection program side because just last month I believe we were awarded a federal grant to pick that up. So over the next five years, we'll be building out a produce safety inspection program, which has not existed before at the state level in Minnesota. So more to come on that. So our legal authority comes from Minnesota state statute and rule. And you know these three circles kind of represent our, the pieces of our programs that really interact the most with the public. Um, based on the legal authority that we have. So we have our inspection program. Those are inspectors that go out and do inspections every day. We have our compliance program, and our compliance officers are based in St. Paul, and they work with the inspection program when they need to, you know, when there are serious violations that they need to address. And then we also have our outreach and education piece, which, you know, we're out as much as we possibly can be uh, either listening or you know doing presentations like this, just trying to describe what we're doing and trying to figure out how we can be the most helpful, basically. Our inspection staff are scattered throughout the state and they're all based out of their home offices. So it's very rare actually that you'll find an inspection staff member in St. Paul. Um, the map on the left, is actually our commercial feed program. And you can see we have one inspector that basically has the entire northern third of Minnesota. And then the territories get smaller as you come south from there. The map on the right is actually what our retail inspection, food inspection territories will look like. We're still in the process of hiring and training all of those people. So it's that one is still a work in progress and it's not live on the internet at this point, but it will be live probably within the next six months or so. So I just kind of wanted to run through um, an overview of you know, our regulations and how they relate to food safety, or at least the regulations that we enforce. So at the farm level, you know, we're basically trying to establish an approved source for our manufacturers, wholesalers, and retailers. We look at safe farm production, so good agricultural practices, and then we will be picking up the produce safety rule when it goes into effect. So 
specific examples of things that we would look at would include water quality, um, are there animals that are present in the farm, are they using manure or other biological soil amendments, are there worker training programs in place talking about health hygiene exclusion, um, and then you know, what is the condition of the equipment, the tools in the buildings that are being used. In terms of wholesale, you know, that's where we get into the food manufacturing plants and then the warehouses. And there again, we're working to establish to prove sources, in this case for other wholesalers or for retail environments. And we're looking at safe manufacturing, storage and distribution. So there are good manufacturing practices which are in the federal, the code of federal regulations. We enforce those at the state level. And then the Preventive Controls for Human Food rule came about as part of the Food Safety Modernization Act and actually just went into effect September 19th. So we're just starting to roll that out at this point. And it, part of the Preventive Controls for Human Food rule was actually an update to the good manufacturing practices. So we have a, a, double, a double learning curve there for our inspectors and they're just starting to do those inspections. Specific examples of what we might be looking at would be, um, you know, do facilities have a hazard analysis in place if they are doing products that require that? Same thing for the preventive controls plan. Um, do they have one in place if they need to? Again, looking at worker training, health and hygiene, uh, cleaning and sanitation in the facilities, and then what is the condition of the equipment, tools and buildings? In terms of retail regulation, we, we do look at grocery stores, convenience stores, and food stands. And there we are primarily enforcing the Minnesota Food Code, which will be you know, similar to the Minnesota Department of Health. And I know Stephen will talk about that in more detail just a little bit here in the future. In terms of retail food safety, we're looking for, again, you know, very similar things across the board. Um, but we do also look at package integrity at retail because that's kind of the last stop before consumers pick it up. And then we also do label review because we're mostly dealing with packaged food in our grocery stores and convenience stores. So within this last year, uh, which is about how long I've been in this position now as our outreach coordinator, um, we've been really working on talking to as many groups as possible and, you know, being a part of advisory committees, you know, if, if, it's, if it's useful for, for the committee to have someone from MDA there. Um, it's always useful for us because it's, it's very helpful for us to know what, what conversations are happening and, you know, if there are things that we need to change or resources that we need to develop, that's, that's really the best way for us to find out about them. So these are just two examples of things that I've been involved with in the last year. Um, there's a Bush Foundation Community Innovation Grant that a number of partners, actually that Tim mentioned earlier, were working on for about a year. And the main focus of that work was to look at our licensing system and to try and figure out how it could be made a little bit more transparent and accessible because it, the message that we were getting was that it was extremely complicated to try and just get licensed as a, as a food business in Minnesota. So definitely more work to come on that. There were a number of recommendations that came out of that advisory committee work. And we're just starting to kind of take those up and carry them forward now. And we're trying a couple of different things to see if we can make that process better. And then the Food Charter Cross Agency Working Group is um, a group of state employees from a number of different agencies. And, you know, we're meeting every other month or so to talk about how, as state agencies, we can support each other and work together to kind of move some of the food charter strategies forward. And there are different agencies working on different strategies, so it's, it's been really great to hear about that and to hear how they may be affecting the work that we're doing. Um, so there, there's people from the Department of Transportation, Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, um, we're just now reaching out to Department of Corrections and a couple other agencies, Department of Human Services is part of that group as well.
So uh, just in summary, you know, we've, we've gone through a pretty significant change in our inspection program during the last year. So we've kind of completely redesigned the programs. And we're really moving towards more education and collaboration. We've, we've always tried to have all businesses treated equally in terms of how they're being regulated. But at this point, in order to increase equity, we want to make sure that people are getting the right information at the right time. And it's actually the information that they need in a format that they can understand. So rather than kind of a one-size-fits-all model, we're, we're trying to move towards more tailored, more specific information if that's appropriate. And part of that is with our split of inspection programs, then we know that our inspectors, it'll be easier for our inspectors to know kind of the spectrum of information that's available so that they know what their, what their tools or what their resources are when they're working with individual businesses. We are also working on new tools to convey information. So one of the things that came up in that Bush grant discussion was you know, is there a way to do kind of a TurboTax model of licensing? So we actually picked that up and we're working on what we're calling an e-licensing food safety wizard right now. And it's um, set to go live on our website in December of 2016. And the idea is to just have a series of, a short series of questions that will help people kind of get to the license that they would need based on the business that they're planning on doing. So it, it gives people a little bit more information before they call our office, and it also kind of points to whether you need to call our office or the Department of Health or a local health agency. We're also working on redesigning our starting a food business handouts, and that's kind of in partnership or kind of in tandem with that e-licensing food safety wizard. It will be the same information but in a kind of PDF format. and our existing document, I think, is over 50 pages, so we're trying to kind of streamline that and make it really focused on our food safety and inspection authority and what we actually do. And then we're also working on completely redesigning our web content to make that more accessible and to have more options, you know, different types of materials, different resources that are available, and just try and reorganize the content a little bit because a lot of people have said it's difficult to find things. So that's, that's kind of a summary of things that we're working on at the moment to, to work towards increasing equity. And I should say that e-licensing food safety wizard, we're actually going to have that translated into Somali, Hmong, and Spanish. So those three languages will be available on our website for that tool in December. Questions uh, come up sometimes from time to time. When you talk about um, yeah, food businesses. When you think of that, can you explain that a little bit more, or define that a little bit better? Um, I mean, more, more detail. What do you mean by a food business? Uh, what is a food business? I mean, for us, a food business is anyone who's doing anything with food, honestly. So, and that it is a difficult word or term because a lot of people use the word business for different things. But but for us it really is anyone who calls us and says, you know, I want to start doing XYZ with food and I want to sell it, basically. So when once you're starting to move towards commercial sale, we would kind of classify you as a food business. It's not that's not a legal term in the statute though. I mean that's just kind of the way that we use that term internally. So uh, these resources I've kind of touched on the first two. You know, we'll have this e-licensing and food safety wizard available. We're working on completely redoing our website. Um, the other kind of exciting resource that I wanted to highlight and mention today is that we have a new position, also really outreach related. Um, it's a licensing liaison position, and James Rucker is in that position right now. He's been with MDA for uh, quite a few years. He was a compliance officer and inspector. He's he knows quite a bit about food safety regulation, especially especially with the Department of Agriculture. And he answers starting a food business questions and cottage food questions. Um, and many, many of those 
every day. He's actually on vacation right now and we're covering for him and it's extremely difficult. So. It takes two or three people to cover for him. But there's his contact information and then our main phone number there as well. And with that, I will pass it to Stephen. Thank you, Val. Uh, so I want to kind of give a brief overview of some of the pro proposed changes that we have coming to the Minnesota Food Code, as well as uh, kind of a shift in, in philosophy, so to speak, uh, in regulation, kind of both at the state level and at the federal level. I want to discuss a little bit about uh, equity regulations and uh, where those items uh, kind of converge and uh, the balancing act that uh, we all kind of have to play as we kind of uh, deal with those issues. And I also want to highlight a few uh, collaboration efforts uh, and best practices for collaborating on those uh, important equity and regulation issues kind of uh, in the future as we uh, proceed forward. And then finally, I, I am going to provide a few resources on how to, to navigate specifically the food pools and lodging um, regulatory system uh, since we do have quite a few uh, uh, local units of government that are locally delegated and uh, um, it just uh, provides a good opportunity for us to, to provide resources and information of how to get in touch with uh, the person, whether they're uh, city, county, or state uh, that uh, would uh, uh, represent you uh, in any type of food business business that you run. So first, uh, kind of a brief uh, uh, history of the food code. Uh, Minnesota Department of Health is partnered with Department of Agriculture. Uh, we're both responsible for regulating the Minnesota food code at uh, retail food establishments in Minnesota. Our food code was last updated in 1998, and uh, it's based off of uh, the 1995 and 1998 FDA model food codes. It has a few provisions from each of those. Um, and to put it into perspective, FDA uh, starting around 2001 uh, began releasing new food codes every four years uh, and uh, Every two years, they would release a supplement or an addendum to the food code, making clarifications, some slight changes and modifications. So we're actually quite a few iterations behind. Uh, we did start uh, the formal rulemaking process in 2009. We held a, a kind of two separate stakeholder meetings, which I think really kind of highlight uh, a, a shift uh, that occurred around 2009 for our agency in collaborating with outside uh, groups and organizations, which I'll touch on a little bit later later. Uh, we are in the process of uh, finalizing the draft. We uh, recently, in the last week and a half or so, uh, just updated our uh, MDH website uh, with the most current version of the draft rule that we've received back from the revisor's office. Uh, we are kind of earmarking uh, early 2017 for a hearing date uh, for the rule, um, and uh, hopefully sometime in the second half of 2017, the rule changes could become effective. Um, <clears throat> So this next graphic is just uh, an example of uh, what rulemaking actually is in the state of Minnesota and all of the steps that uh, an agency like Department of Health and Agriculture have to go through to adopt rules. Um, and of course, the more changes you make to a rule, uh, the slower the process goes because there's more actual physical paper that needs to be created, uh, reviewed, and approved by many, many uh, entities uh, outside of the agencies, uh, which seems to be kind of the big the big slowdown for us in terms of uh, rulemaking. I think the important take home here is that it is a, 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 a very cumbersome process, uh, but the, the agencies have kind of put something in place uh, uh, to, to basically go through iterative rulemaking, uh, specifically for the food code, uh, after this food code is adopted. Uh, so again, if we hit that targeted uh, second half of 2017, uh, effective date for the food code, we would immediately go into food, uh, food code rule revision to make small changes, those few changes that are identified in the FDA uh, you know, 2017 version of the food code, for example. Uh, so hopefully we won't have a 20-year process uh, between uh, uh, rule versions in the future and we'll uh, really be able to keep up to date with the current food safety uh, science and practices. <clears throat> 
So quick uh, review too, where does the food code apply? Again, it's, it's applied to food establishments, uh, specifically for MDH and our locally delegated facilities. It's really kind of restaurant or immediate service types of facilities, concession stands that are f selling food to, that are gonna be consumed on site. Uh, um, and we again have 31 locally delegated agencies, which encompass city, uh, county, and multi-county jurisdictions, uh, as well as the uh, MDH provides uh, inspection services in about 50 counties in the state as well. Um, and uh, Val already touched on the uh, Department of Agriculture's kind of role in retail food safety. It's important to, to note that it doesn't apply to nursing homes, uh, hospitals, adult foster cares, other types of exempt, uh, uh, you know, healthcare facilities, uh, as well as uh, um, some of those other facilities that, uh, um, that Val had mentioned earlier, food manufacturing facilities uh, or areas where maybe the uh, farm uh, re regulations would apply. So really the big philosophical shift for this rule is, is shifting a lot of the regulations from uh, kind of an arbitrary number or value or parameter to uh, uh, open up the rule and make it more flexible for regulators and for businesses, uh, really kind of all focused on risk. Uh, the decision points kind of around risk. Uh, and so it really kind of breaks down uh, both in statute and, and the, the spirit of the law that we're kind of trying to craft in the food code uh, into uh, uh, kind of three different tiers of food service establishments. There's low risk, medium risk, and high risk. If we think about the low risk, uh, they sell uh, prepackaged foods or foods that don't have to be temperature controlled for safety, um, so they don't have to be put in a placed in a refrigerator or hot holding unit. That's going to be your perfect example of a low risk establishment. Medium medium risk establishments kind of prepare and serve food uh, um, uh, to order, uh, and these are items that are normally things that need to be uh, temperature controlled for safety. Uh, and high risk adds another step, uh, whether it's uh, you know, cooking and then cooling and reheating it for later service or subjecting that food to some kind of special process like acidification or reduced oxygen packaging to, you know, extend the shelf life of a product or render a product non-TCS uh, non or non-potentially hazardous. Uh, those are kind of the three real broad buckets that you can uh, really sort uh, every food business into. <clears throat> And so again, just trying to give a very specific example of low, medium, and high risk. Uh, um, if we wanted to, to look at tomato bisque, uh, you could be uh, a good example of low risk would be if you sold cans of tomato bisque at a retail location. Now, the next tier up, the medium risk example, is a small cafe that wants to prepare a soup from scratch, or maybe they uh, actually prepare it from the can, they add a few additional ingredients, but they're really serving it uh, to the customer's order. There's not a lot of holding in between uh, uh, preparation and service. Uh, it's a good example of medium risk. And then high risk is the facility that really wants to make large batches or quantities of food product. They want to portion it, cool it down, and then they're going to reheat it for later service. They might be hot holding uh, portions of it, uh, so they actually have a steam table or a soup well or soup warmer where they uh, store that food product for a long period of time. <clears throat> And so why do we break items down by risk uh, in this rule and in Minnesota statute? It's really because uh, there's kind of an escalating scale of risk uh, that uh, or hazards that uh, uh, come into play at the various tiers. So at low risk, uh, we're really talking about products that are for the most part kind of being re received by the food establishment in their final state. They're already packaged, they're ready to be consumed. Uh, so one of the, the major risks that's associated with those types of businesses is uh, for them to actually receive product that's already contaminated. They don't have any uh, uh, real role or responsibility in ensuring the product safety uh, above and beyond, uh, you know, checking appropriate sources that it's coming from uh, approved areas, things like that. But they don't have direct control over the food safety of that product in many instances. There is some norovirus risk, of course, and other contamination risk if you've got ill employees that are working in a low-risk establishment. Um, but for the most part, the, the hazards are, are pretty, pretty low. Uh, so then you go up to the next 
next here, and we've got medium risk establishments. Uh, all of the low risk uh, uh, hazards exist, and now there's additional uh, hazards because you might have improper handling, bare hand contact of food product, improper cooking, things like that, uh, that kind of add additional hazards to that food product. Uh, and then at the high risk level, again, you've got all of the low and medium risks, plus you've got some additional risks that are being added on to this process or this product uh, because of uh, additional processes like cooling or reheating or that specialized processing like acidifying or reheating a food product. <clears throat> and so, you know, what risks would you assign to an establishment? Uh, we like to use this one as an example because most people think of sushi as, as high risk. Uh, it's, you know, it's foreign to a lot of people. It seems like there's a lot of steps that are involved in the process. And, and in many instances, uh, most places that do produce sushi, it is, it is a high risk process for that establishment. Uh, but the important thing here is to understand that it can be done in a, in a low-risk uh, uh, manner. Uh, for example, the grocery store that purchases a prepackaged sushi product, uh, for that grocery store, that process or the handling of that product is low risk. Uh, now, the manufacturing facility that produced that sushi in packaged form, it's high risk most likely for that location. But for that retail store that's selling the prepackaged item, low risk. Again, you could be assembling items on site to order, maybe not using a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, raw animal products like raw fish. It's a good example of a medium risk uh, uh, process. Uh, and then uh, the high risk kind of takes it up to that next level. A lot of places are acidifying their rice so that they can keep it out at room temperature and they don't have to temperature control it. Uh, they're using multiple, um, you know, raw animal products uh, that they want to serve or intend to serve raw. So there's uh, quite a few uh, risks that are associated with that high risk process. But the real point is that almost any menu item uh, can be done in a low, medium, or high risk fashion. <clears throat> And so some examples of how risk is applied in the proposed language in the food code. Uh, we are switching the violations from critical and non-critical. Uh, we had a two-tiered system before uh, to saying that violations are categorized as priority one, two, or three based on their severity or their risk. Um, so priority one items are the items that you should focus on first. Those are the items that have kind of a direct impact on food safety. Priority two items are things that uh, uh, kind of inform or uh, lead into those priority one uh, items or help support those priority one items. And your priority three items are kind of your general uh, uh, good retail practice uh, uh, issues uh, um, that uh, if they get so overblown in a facility could lead to foodborne illness or increased uh, risk, uh, but for the most part they're, they're more supportive in nature. And a good example of this is actually uh, thinking about hand washing. If you don't wash your hands, that is a priority one violation. If you wash your hands, but the hand sink isn't stocked with paper towels, so you have to go to a different location to find paper towels, that might make it more of a barrier for washing hands. And so the hand, hand sink being stocked appropriately are priority two violation. Now, not having the appropriate signage at the hand sink, reminding employees to wash their hands is a good example of a priority three uh, violation. So, um, and again, uh, another example is uh, we, we, we kind of looked at everything through the lens of risk when it came to equipment um, and said, okay, let's, let's kind of uh, narrow the scope of the pieces of equipment that require some type of commercial standard uh, to be met uh, down to uh, equipment that directly impact priority, viol uh, priority one violations. Things like cooking or cold holding equipment, so refrigerator units and ovens and stoves and deep fat fryers, um, where performance and cleanability would have a, a really direct impact on those priority one issues. Um, uh, also, kind of looking at, again at that menu complexity to determine uh, whether commercial equipment is required um, ship or moving or shifting away from uh, uh, an arbitrary number like, uh, you know, if you serve 10 or fewer meals per day and you're a certain license type, you can have, uh, uh, you know, residential equipment to saying if you produce a menu with a certain risk level uh, or a certain level of complexity complexity, uh, then you could use residential equipment. 
Um, also used to see if a certified food protection manager is required based on, uh, again, the complexity and risk associated with your menu. Um, <clears throat> so with all that focus on kind of a shift in philosophy and concept for the regulations, how does equity kind of play a role in this? Um, I think what's what's important for us as regulators and for industry to to, to really kind of uh, wrestle with is to to understand that it really is a balance between the social, the economic, and the environmental needs of the both the food establishment, but the population in general, uh, the public that's going to be consuming that food product, and, and kind of looking at all of those uh, together uh, as a whole. Um, and kind of a recognition that uh, exemptions, regulations, and policies all can play a role in, in actually, uh, you know, uh, lessening the di equity divide or further uh, furthering the equity divide. Um, and a good example of that is kind of at the federal level, uh, there is a, a, a definite push to uh, potentially require that anybody who's kind of deemed as a person in charge in a food establishment, um, you know, the person who's who says they're responsible when a regulator comes in for inspection, for example, that that person in charge would have to be a certified food manager. Now, from a public health perspective, there's a lot of really good examples uh, and uh, uh, recent research studies that show that having a certified food protection manager actually decreases your risk of having a foodborne illness outbreak. So as public health officials, we say, oh, this is, this is a great regulation. We need to get behind this and because it, it, it furthers the charge of public health. Um, but if we don't come at it and, and look at it through the lens of health equity, um, we potentially can set ourselves up for kind of furthering that, that divide of, of, of equity uh, because certified food protection manager courses um, are very readily available for English speakers. Uh, but there's uh, not nearly as much variety, uh, location, and availability for uh, the non-English courses. Courses that are in Spanish or Somali or Hmong or Mandarin, uh, they exist, uh, but the resources that are available are more limited. Uh, it's just more difficult for those uh, cultures to be able to gain access to that type of training. So if we just blindly, uh, you know, establish that as the new regulation moving forward, we could actually make it more difficult for non-English speaking businesses to uh, uh, meet the requirements of the food code. And so this is a good example of where recognizing the, the public health importance of this, uh, this requirement uh, um, and then kind of <clears throat> we as regulators uh, uh, really uh, informing both the public and the industry of its importance uh, is uh, really kind of vital and key for us. But it's also a good opportunity for all of us to kind of partner together and figure out if, if we wanted to accept that type of regulation moving forward, what could we do to kind of, uh, you know, uh, lessen that gap of equity? Uh, what resources do we have, uh, have at the state, local, the city level, at the industry level to provide uh, additional training resources, for example, or some other materials that could be provided uh, to, to make that uh, a possibility for all persons in charge to be a certified food manager, for example? And so ways to collaborate, I think uh, these are really kind of basic uh, uh, keys, but I think they're important. Uh, I mentioned earlier in 2009, we uh, pulled together our first uh, stakeholder advisory committee meeting for the food code. Um, and uh, all of our advisory co uh, committees that we've pulled together since then, uh, we've really focused on trying to find as diverse a group of representatives as possible so that we can hear every single voice or as many voices as possible as we can of work on issues like this, whether it's the interpretation of a requirement or the creation or modification of, of requirements uh, in general. Um, and I think it's important for uh, all groups to, to really kind of uh, inform others around them uh, the issues that you're working on. Um, and. Uh, to, to extend that invitation. Uh, uh, if you're going to be hosting a meeting and uh, you've got other groups that you know that are working on similar issues or, or maybe just working on food safety or food access uh, in general, uh, extending that uh, uh, invite is a, an important first step to kind of help us to collaborate uh, uh, better together in the future. 
um, and kind of recognizing that there's a lot of groups out there that uh, potentially are working uh, towards similar goals and finding a way to uh, leverage uh, the momentum that each of those groups are kind of producing um, to, uh, you know, push forward uh, various uh, uh, goals and initiatives that those groups are striving for. <clears throat> Uh, so again, I mentioned that uh, we've got uh, many, many partners that work uh, with the uh, retail food regulation in the state of Minnesota. Uh, Val covered the Department of Agriculture side. From the MDH uh, food pools and lodging side, uh, the lightest blue counties that are here on the list uh, are, are the counties that uh, are directly regulated by MDH. And then the uh, uh, darker shaded blue counties are locally delegated uh, programs. Um, <clears throat> And I think the most important resource that we can kind of provide is uh, we do have a licensing jurisdiction webpage uh, that you can go to. You can then uh, click on, uh, they, we have both an interactive map as well as a, a PDF directory uh, that is constantly updated that tells you who your inspector is in the various cities, counties, and state jurisdiction, depending on where your food business is going to be operating. Um, we do also have uh, our updated resources for uh, the food code. Um, you can sign up to be a part of the mailing list, get uh, information informational uh, uh, things sent to you. Uh, you can get all of your status updates. Uh, like I mentioned, we did uh, recently uh, post a new draft version of the language. Um, and uh, we also have a document on there that's called our 20 questions document. And it covers really the uh, kind of the the largest or the 20 most uh, uh, impactful major changes uh, in the draft uh, uh, Minnesota food code. Um, <clears throat> And so with that, um, looks like we're ready to open it up for questions. Thank you, Stephen and Val, uh, for all the time and talent and expertise you put into together to make the webinar. Um, I think we're going to for one question for sure, and maybe two. We'll see. So the first question, I, and you touch on this a little bit, Stephen, um, the kind of groups that we're forming around food access. So we, we have in Minnesota now about, I think over 60 that we know of, the, I mean, the number may not be exactly right, but 60 food policy councils, networks, partnerships. Food safety has a couple uh, food safety partnerships and the uh, governor's task force and those kind of things. These organizations are multi-stakeholders that are dealing with the food system. So the question first to Stephen and then Val. How a local food policy council working, you know, how can local food policy councils work with uh, inspectors at MDA and MDH? So, Stephen? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a number of ways that they could work uh, with uh, both uh, at the inspector level, but also at kind of the agency level. And I think the first one is actually reaching out and, and getting into contact with your inspector, whether that is a locally delegated agency or MDH. Um, communication is important, and I think it's it's kind of vital and key for us to, to really drive home the, the message that uh, um, <clears throat> There's no reason not to contact the regulators. Uh, we always are looking for opportunities to, to kind of, you know, talk about your business, talk about what it is you're interested in. If you're a group that's uh, trying to move a particular initiative forward, to understand what your reasoning is behind that and help, uh, you know, inform uh, the discussion and to provide information uh, uh, for for that group kind of moving forward. Um, and again, if you contact your local inspector, uh, they will oftentimes, uh, uh, whether it's at the local or the state level, they would kind of, you know, bring that up to their manager. Management. Um, obviously, contacting uh, myself uh, or uh, other supervisors here at uh, MDH is also a good way to uh, kind of engage us uh, kind of at a higher policy or rule uh, level. So it really kind of depends on, on what it is they, they want to do, but I, I really want to get the message out there uh, that uh, it's, it's always a good idea to contact your inspector. Uh, 
in my experience, every time I had an issue with, uh, you know, a, an inspection or, you know, some type of compliance issue that just really didn't go well or go right, uh, it was because communication didn't happen early and often uh, in the process. It was always the, you know, we found a surprise business that was operating or a business that was wanting to do something different and, and without asking, uh, you know, how can I do this safely, how can I do this correctly, they just made the decision. To, to go ahead and change a process or practice, and it just uh, had a tendency to lead to more issues than if they would have made a, a five-minute, uh, you know, phone call or sent an email. Uh, we could have uh, kind of addressed a lot of those issues issues uh, uh, oftentimes ahead of time. That's a good point. Communication is the biggest ally and challenge. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, one other point is uh, before I turn to you, Val, a lot of people. We don't realize that whether you're a state inspector or a local inspector, you're part of, you know, they're part of the community. They work and maybe live in or near the community they're inspecting, whether they're MDA, state, uh, or local. So they're part of uh, community decision making. And Val? Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree with what Stephen said. I think the only you know, we, we do want to encourage people to talk to their inspectors as early as possible. Uh, and especially if they're starting a food business. But at this point, probably the easiest way for people to get in touch with those inspectors is to contact our main office. We're, we're just asking that all, all calls come to St. Paul first and then more easily get you to the right person in the field. And that's a direct um, result of our complete reorganization. So. It's very difficult to find contact information right now on our website, and we're working on making that much easier, and it, it will be within the next six months to a year. But at the moment, probably the easiest way to start that communication is to contact, <coughs> excuse me, either you can definitely feel free to contact me directly or, um, you know, our main office phone number, which was, which was part of this slide set. So we would... We welcome the communication. It's really the best way for us to know what's going on, and that's that's how we learn, you know, what work we need to focus on and what may need to change. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for the responses, and I think that's about what we had time for. Thank you all for joining, and then I think I'll turn it to Mary for a recap on what's the next step and how this uh, webinar will be available. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded, and um, you'll be receiving a link to the recorded webinar in the next couple of days. And in addition to um, the webinar, the slide deck will be available, and um, you'll also be receiving an email um, when the three resources that I mentioned from the Public Health Law Center will be made available, which will um, be later this week. So thanks again for starting your Monday off with us, and thanks to um, Tim, Val, and Stephen. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions about food safety as we all try to move towards a healthier diet and lifestyle, and I think that understanding the food safety system is a really important part of that um, process.